Be sure to subscribe and click on the bell for notifications on future uploads. Hello everyone, Simon Bart here, or you can call me Sully. It's Mother's Day, and for this video, I have a very special way to celebrate it. Because I'm not going to review a short or a movie or TV special around the holiday, I'm going to let my mother talk about her top 10 favorite movies. Yep, my own mother will be going over her favorite movies for Mother's Day. And do stay tuned after her list for a little announcement that she makes. So, I'll let her take over things from here now, and I'll see you later. Hi, I'm Riley Kilmore, and I've been invited by Sullivan to give you my top 10 favorite movie list for Mother's Day. Because, spoiler alert, I'm Sullivan's mom. But first, you know this is hard, right? There are a lot of movies out there, and it's hard to pick your... 10 favorite ones. It's like trying to pick your top 10 favorite books or your top 10 favorite flavors of ice cream. But you know what? Sullivan is an understanding son and he said I can have a runner-up list. So I'm gonna share my runner-up list with you first and then we'll get to my top 10 favorite movies of all time. So briefly, nine movies I love but that got knocked out of the top 10 list in the final analysis are, in no particular order of rank, Taurus Balba. This 1962 movie, starring Yul Brenner and Tony Curtis, one of my favorite actors from childhood, was one I happened to cross, like I did all movies I watched when I was a kid. It was aired on one of the three television channels we had to choose from, and you knew what was going to be aired by reading through the weekly TV guide in advance, and then planning your life around what you didn't want to miss. Taurus Balba probably wouldn't have made this list if I'd seen it first as an adult. But as a kid, it captured my imagination, featured family dynamics, starred Tony Curtis, had swords and castles, and horses. What a winning combination, right? Little Women. There are many movie adaptations of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, but for me, the defining one was the 1994 version starring Winona Ryder and Susan Sarandon. As the youngest of five daughters, I was swept up at an early age into the world of Alcott's various novels, and nothing about this movie disappoints. Every element is so beautifully done, the overall effect creating a strong sense of nostalgia for a time that none of us even experienced, which is, from an emotional standpoint, probably the goal of any coming-of-age historical drama. At this point, I could probably have this movie playing in the background as a sort of high-class white noise and not grow tired of it. The Robe, the 1953 adaptation of the 1943 Lloyd Douglas novel by the same name, starring Richard Burton, Gene Simmons, and Victor Mature, is a movie I grew up watching every Easter, and a tradition I continued into my adulthood, long after my ability to recognize the campiness of many moments. I guess in that way it's just become one of those guilty pleasures in life. And as with many of my favorite movies, it's the soundtrack that continues to sell it year after year, even after the quality of the acting or the production fades considerably. I Am Sam, this 2001 Sean Penn Michelle Pfeiffer movie that pits a decent father with an intellectual disability against a system that favors denying him his parental rights touched me deeply for reasons that may be apparent to some. While it didn't garner stellar accolades by any means, it broached an important societal topic. And aren't brave acts often the point of art? To my way of thinking, it's a complex and difficult subject, and no one piece of art should be denigrated simply because it could not address every nuance. And hey, it's a movie, right? It wasn't intended as a treatise or a documentary. Into the West, this 1992 Irish tale of magical realism about the gypsy-like travelers of Ireland captured my heart 
for its betrayal of loss, as seen through the eyes of a pair of young brothers. Written by Jim Sheridan, known for My Left Foot, this story takes on grief, the clash of cultures, and the use of the police by the rich and powerful to enforce property rights in their favor. Toss in a mystical white horse called Tirna Nog and a moving soundtrack, and all the elements are in place for a must-watch movie. Brigadoon. I watched a lot of musicals growing up, but the only one to make my list, even as a runner-up, is Brigadoon, a 1954 flick starring Gene Kelly and Sid Charisse, based on the 1947 play by Alan J. Lerner. Gene Kelly was one of my earliest loves and one of the inspirations that led me to want to become a dancer. Brigadoon is a love story set in a mystical Scottish village that appears only one day every 100 years. What could possibly go wrong? Rewatching all the great movies we grew up with is almost like being in love. Tuck Everlasting, a wonderful story by author Natalie Babbitt in her 1975 novel of the same name. Tuck Everlasting was nicely adapted to film in 2002 and stars Alexis Bidel, Sissy Spacek, Jonathan Jackson, William Hurt, and Ben Kingsley. This memorable urban fantasy takes on the topic of immortality, not the blessing one might think, and of exploitation driven by greed. Highly recommended. Flight of the Navigator. This 1986 sci-fi adventure is such a delight, telling the tale of 12-year-old David Freeman, who is kidnapped by an alien spaceship named Max, voiced enjoyably by Paul Rubens of Pee Wee Herman fame. Sarah Jessica Parker also appears. Watch it for yourself and have a little retro fun. The Mighty. The Mighty is another movie about a 12-year-old boy, a basic setup for just about any film I'm practically guaranteed to enjoy, probably because I grew up feeling very much that I was meant to be born a boy. The movie is an adaptation of author Rodman Philbrick's book, Freak the Mighty. It features Sharon Stone, Gillian Anderson, Kieran Calkin, and Eldon Henson. Too complex a tale to sum up here in detail, the story champions the healing power of friendship, addresses grief, and, as critic Roger Ebert observed, it shows how imagination can be a weapon in life. That said, it's a tearjerker, so I'll rate this one three plus hankies. Okay, so now on to my top ten favorite list. I can't wait to find out if any of your personal favorites match my top ten list. Let's find out. Number 10, It's a Wonderful Life. If this movie needs an introduction, you either don't celebrate Christmas or you were raised on a different planet. This 1946 Frank Capra film is a much beloved classic and like a lot of you, I must have watched it 30 or 40 times at this point in my life, if not more. So based on the fact that despite numbers like that, I can still look forward to watching it year after year. It seems a no-brainer that It's a Wonderful Life should be on my list of top 10 favorites. Enough said. Except this. Gee, Brainless, another way to tell if a movie is one of your top 10 favorites is take note how many times a month, a week, a day, or an hour someone in your family is quoting the movie. Hot dog! Isn't it wonderful? I'm going to jail! Number nine, A Muppet Christmas Carol. This is another holiday favorite for many and another one my husband and I have watched nearly every year since it first aired in 1992. And what's not to love? The magic and legacy of Jim Henson combined with the genius of Charles Dickens and brought to life by actor Michael Caine and Muppeteer Frank Oz and crew. It's a visual feast, peppered with humor, warmth, and the memorable music and lyrics of Miles Goodman and Paul Williams. If you've never seen it, what are you waiting for? Number 8. Roxanne. Another remake of a classic, Roxanne, was a favorite of my husband's and mine from the first time we saw it back in 1987. Adapted from the play Sereno de Bergerac by Edmund Rostand, Roxanne stars Steve Martin and Daryl Hannah. Casting Martin as a small-town fire chief, leading a hapless band of ragtag volunteer firefighters. So anyone who knows anything at all about my husband and I will immediately understand why we connected with this movie and continue to watch it to this day. Number 7. Galaxy Quest. Like most of my fave movies, Galaxy Quest captured me from the start 
back when it debuted in 1999. And like all our favorite movies, it's one we own and watch over and over again. Galaxy Quest stars Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver, Alan Rickman, and Tony Shalhoub in a Star Trek parody that pits a cast of washed-up sci-fi TV show actors against real-life interstellar enemies. In the end, members of the television show's fan base are the ones who rise to the role of hero. Number six, While You Were Sleeping. This film from 1995 was one my husband and I didn't happen across until it was already about two decades old. Years ago, we turned our backs on commercial TV and had developed the habit of picking up DVDs here and there of movies or TV shows we thought we might like to watch whenever we got around to it. While You Were Sleeping was one of those that had landed in our to-be-watched pile, but one we avoided for a long time based on the premise of it being a romance blossoming between a woman and her fiancé's brother while said fiancé was in a coma. Of course, it wasn't really that at all, which we were glad to discover when it was the last movie in the pile and we were out of options on a day we wanted to watch a movie. Of course, we knew who Sandra Bullock was, who doesn't, and we loved her, who doesn't, but it was an introduction for me to Bill Pullman, whom I just loved in this. It is a funny, touching, endearing movie with a top-notch cast, one of those movies you never tired of watching, and despite knowing the ending, it still leaves you feeling good all over again. Number five, The Boy Who Could Fly. This film dates to 1986, but as with a lot of media, we were late to the game to see it. I can't recall when we did finally see it, but I do remember saying, wow, look how little Fred Savage is. He played the kid brother to Lucy Deacon's portrayal of the main character, Millie. The movie also stars Jay Underwood, Bonnie Bedelia, Fred Gwynn, Colleen Dewhurst, and uh, Mindy Cohen. When I first saw the title, I assumed it would turn out to be allegorical. But, spoiler alert, it isn't. And surprisingly, nothing about it turned out to be silly. The Boy Who Could Fly takes on a lot of difficult topics. Suicide, alcoholism, autism, mental health, single parenting, bullying. And it addresses their impact on children with tenderness and insight through the lens of family, neighborhood, and school life. The acting is phenomenal and led me to travel to Off-Broadway just to see Deacons in a play there. Beyond that, The Boy Who Could Fly is a movie that shatters your heart but then picks up the pieces, glues them together again, and hands it back to you even more whole than it had been before. Number four, A Walk in the Clouds. Another selection from the randomly acquired to be watched pile, it turned out to be a staggeringly lovely film. It's a 1995 Walk in the Clouds starring Keanu Reeves, Itana Sanchez Guillon, and uh, Anthony Quinn. Set in post-World War II times, Reeves plays a kind G.I. who winds up posing as a husband to Sanchez Guillon, who is pregnant out of wedlock and afraid to face her hot-tempered father, who is the owner of a profitable vineyard. Everything about this movie is gently gripping, from the writing and the acting to the cinematography and the pacing. A Walk in the Clouds is as close to a warm hug as a film can get and still feel real. Number three, Dave. I think Dave was also a movie acquired somewhere along the way and stashed in that to-be-watched pile, which turned out to be a pretty profitable pile as cinema gold goes. Kevin Klein and Sigourney Weaver star, along with a terrific supporting cast in this 1993 political comedy. He plays the affable owner of a temp agency who also just happens to be a doppelganger for the President of the United States. When the President suffers a stroke while in bed with his mistress and falls into a coma, White House operatives, with ambitions of their own, snag Dave as a stand-in before the world can find out. Sigourney Weaver plays the tough First Lady, seen as a bit of a barracuda by the staff, who's eventually won over by Dave's heart of gold, something her President and husband decidedly lacked. Dave also features Charles Grodin as Murray Bloom, his accountant, who steals the show when he single-handedly rewrites the budget of the United States into the sensible document it ought to be, cutting out all sorts of pork and providing for the continuation of a homeless shelter that houses many children. 
Number two, Dances with Wolves. This movie is usually the one I refer to as my favorite, but for the purposes of this top 10 list, I felt it was important to take into consideration a number of things. So all else being equal, which is of course, well, they aren't, I am teetering on saying my number two and my number one picks are really a tie. And I ordered them this way simply because my number one pick, which I'll get to in a moment, was my favorite since childhood, and therefore deeply formative for me in a lot of ways that Dances with Wolves wasn't. So to that end, Dances with Wolves felt to me more like a, a fulfillment of being as opposed to the formation of being, as far as anything in the entertainment industry can be said to be either of those metaphysical things. Well, I speak here primarily as the writer and author I've become. But uh, let's get back to the movie. So chances are you're already familiar, at least to some extent, with this movie, even though it debuted way back in 1990, because it was that big and it was that good. It stars, of course, Kevin Costner as Lieutenant John Dunbar, and it was his directorial debut as well. It also starred Mary McDonnell and Graham Greene, both of whom I adore as actors. I find everything about this movie to be wholly engrossing and captivating. It's a saga for sure, and lives up to that moniker with its sweeping cinematic brushstrokes. The soundtrack is stirring, and it's on my regular playlist, along with nearly all the soundtracks of the movies I've talked to you about today. As long as Dances with Wolves is three hours, it never felt long enough to me, and I looked it up for today's top 10 list, learning that there was a four-hour version later made. So they added back in much of what originally landed on the cutting room floor. Boy, I'd love to get my hands on that version. I also learned that author Michael Blake wrote a sequel novel featuring the characters John Dunbar and Stands with a Fist that takes place 11 years later when they have three kids. So now I must go find that novel. Well, in the end, what makes Dances with Wolves the winner that it is, is the pairing of two things. They're the same two things that make pretty much all movies and all books winners. Number one, characters we love. Characters we want to know. Characters we hope we'll get to see again in a sequel. And if not, ones for whom we'll gladly invest our own time in by writing fan fiction. Am I right or am I right? And number two, what I call emotional pings. A piece of media of any type that manages to hit all the right emotional highs and lows, together with all the nuanced emotions in between. In these ways, and in so many more ways, Dances with Wolves delivers. And I say kudos to everyone who had anything to do with bringing it into the world. And now, my number one top movie pick of all time, one I just watched again the other week, To Kill a Mockingbird. Like several other of the movies I've mentioned, I suspect this one is one that needs no introduction. And if it does, and you aren't already familiar with both the movie and the novel it's based on by Harper Lee, I strongly recommend you watch the film and read the book now. To Kill a Mockingbird debuted in 1962, the same year of the movie Taurus Bulba, which I began with earlier. Harper Lee's novel had come out two years prior, earning critical acclaim and winning the Pulitzer Prize. The novel's acclaim transferred easily to the film version thanks to the performances of Gregory Peck as Atticus Finch, Mary Badham as Scout, Philip Alford as Jem, Brock Peters as Tom Robinson, and Colin Wilcox as the abused Mayella Yule who perjured herself under duress. I was about 10 when I stumbled across this film probably as a Saturday afternoon television offering on a rainy day when I couldn't go out to play. Like it did for countless others, the movie profoundly impacted me. Though the story depicts prejudice in the 1930s South, it felt deeply familiar in the race riot era of the 1960s that I grew up in. Mine was a black and white world in a lot of ways, one filled with news of violence from Vietnam to Watts, from Kent State to the assassinations of Martin Luther King, JFK, and Robert Kennedy, all of it starkly displayed across our living room television screen in black and white, there in the middle of our very white bread town not far north of the Mason-Dixon line. Black and white, too, were all the rules I was being fed, both on the religious front, I was raised Catholic, as well as on the home front and at school. 
what girls could and could not do, what they should and should not wear, how they were expected to behave, who they were expected to become. Seeing To Kill a Mockingbird in the midst of all those difficult and confusing years helped sear the messages it championed into my psyche in a way little else ever did again. I related wholly to Scout. We even had a seldom seen neighbor man we took to referring to as Boo. And believe it or not, there was a tree in front of his house with a big knot hole just above eye level. And many were the times I checked it, hoping to find a pocket knife or a carved soap doll. And as with most of the other movies on my list, the soundtrack, this one composed by Elmer Bernstein, was and still is elemental to me. I embraced this movie soundtrack, together with the music from Little Women that I mentioned earlier, as the soundtrack of my own life. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our time together. If you want to spend more time together, you can always look me up online, Riley Kilmore, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Substack. Oh, and I hope you'll consider buying my newly released children's book, Shay the Brave. Available wherever books are sold online and in some savvy independent bookstores as well. Thank you, Sullivan, for having me as your guest. It's been an honor. And I would like to ask everyone out there to please like, comment, share, and subscribe to Sullivan's YouTube channel. Meanwhile, have a very happy Mother's Day.